drifting poles, uh, the drifting magnetic poles we're, we're aware of. But uh, I was particularly caught by the two days early sunrise in certain uh, Arctic communities. Yeah. Maybe uh, you probably heard about, yes, Lance? Yes, yes. And nobody's, nobody has yet explained that to my satisfaction. Um, where, you know, for hundreds of years, people in, in a small village in Greenland are waiting for the sun to come up, uh, and it comes up two days earlier after a, a long period of no sun. Mm. Uh, also in Norway, and also in, here in Canada, in Nunavut, uh, there were the same kind of reports from very isolated communities. And because nobody is living at the South Pole, we're not getting the equal and opposite stories from down there, because what it's suggesting to me uh, and I'm no, no great science man, but you know, if you're if you're two days early, it means that something's changed in the orbit of the sun and the moon and the earth, right? Right. And is it possible that there was a temporarily temporary wobble there of the actual axis itself, not the magnetic north south? The axis itself temporarily wobbled enough. Mm. Now we'll have to ask our science geeks out there if this is possible. <laughs> but I couldn't find any other explanation, you know. Uh, all of the stuff I read on the net about the, the glaciers have got lower so the sun has less distance to travel to get to this village. And it was all on the wrong side anyway when you checked on Google Earth. You know, that the glaciers were on the wrong side. <laughs> so uh, all of these mysterious happenings, of course, in the news are reported as being totally disparate entities because we're all in cognitive dissonance. Right. If you right. pick them all up <laughs> and then you look at what happened in January, February in North Africa... I mean, you'd have to be pretty thick not to start thinking, wait a minute, could this not be connected perhaps to an overall pattern that includes the sun, the center of the galaxy, uh, and the rest of the universe at large, which is how I choose to look at it. But uh, this could all just be a fairy story, you know, of course. Well, I, I look at it the same way. Uh, and uh, the more I see, the bigger the mystery. <laughs> It is a profound mystery, yeah. And, and this is where I think we need to get a little bit more humble, uh, uh, literally uh, meek of spirit, because the the true meaning of the word meek doesn't mean anybody can come around and kick your butt, you know, and, and right, treat you right, back. Right. Right. It, it means an individual with a very pure awareness of the magic of this second, and and the humility to know that the next second might be is totally beyond your control. You have no idea what's going to happen one second from now, never mind tomorrow. Right. And so this, it behooves all of us to start thinking, what is time? What is now? What does it really mean to live now? We've heard all of the pundits and the prophets talking about be here now, but it is the most singularly difficult and challenging and tremendously, excruciatingly powerful thing to be able to be in the now. And very, very few of us are able to do that. Oh, but if you be in the now, my God, you're going to be powerful when this stuff happens. Oh, yes, absolutely. And so many people uh, are working on that through meditation and through, you know, using various techniques to uh, work on not being in the mind and uh, also being present. Uh, there, there are so many different ways to do this, and it's a unique process, but... Uh, you know, uh, obviously thinking about the past and uh, projecting about the future is not being present. We have to do it, and yet uh, being present to the moment is the miraculous. It is indeed, and you know, uh, the reason I went to Japan in the first place was to study Zen, which to me was the epitome of a practice, not a religion, not even a spiritual system, a practice for being totally present. I began with zazen, which means you sit in a full lotus position, your heels are on the top part of your thighs, pressing down on the femoral artery, thus reducing the amount of blood flow to the brain, which assists you in getting less trapped in the matrix of your own thinking. Mm -hmm. And after several years of that, I saw I need another practice where I can actually see the result of being in the moment, and I chose Zen Archery. Because oh. when you are in the moment, and you really do it all correctly, you hit automatically without thinking, I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit. Yeah. So yeah. the Japanese have got a warrior culture that for literally thousands of years has put people on the spot and in the moment, and of course the epitome of all of that is a samurai. 
because you're standing with the sharpest, strongest sword ever designed by man that can, you know, lop off any part of your body in about 0.2 of a second. Yeah. Everything depends on how present you can be. And if yeah. you're totally present, of course, there's no fear. And I think it's that training, that warrior culture training, and many other cultures have it too, but yeah. the Japanese seem to have done a really, really good job of combining this spiritual system of discipline. And you remember Tom Cruise in, in The Last Samurai. He's in the village. He's, been, uh, he's an enemy, and he's been taken to this village for the winter, and he's looking at the people, and he's observing them. He's going, I'm not a church-going man, and these don't look like religious people to me, but there's something really spiritual about what mm-hmm. they're doing. Mm-hmm. Seeing their discipline. Oh, absolutely. And it's this discipline that we have totally and utterly lost in the West. We've completely blown it. Oh, our yeah. parents and our parents' parents' generations were far more disciplined than we were. Uh, and I beg anybody to disagree with this. We are so easy going and laid back, and if, if anything hits the fan, we'll just lean back on the government and they'll take care of us, right? But all of that is going to go in the way of the dodo bird. You're going to have to be able to take care of yourself and your loved ones from A to Z, but it starts with your mind. Like you said, Lance, it starts with yeah. your mind. Stop yeah. that chattering. Stop yeah, it so now. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. <laughs> Um, you're going to be going back to Japan shortly. Are you going to be assisting in those areas that are have difficulties? What will you? What's next for you in Japan? I leave for Japan tomorrow. Oh, uh, I am going. I'm headed for uh, the epicenter. Uh, I'm headed for a small town called Onagawa, which before the tsunami hit was a beautiful, picturesque fishing village. Uh, home to about 20,000 people. It has a very, uh, its topography is such that there's a very narrow bay leads in to the harbor. Mm. Whereas the tsunami was approximately 10 meters high in most of the other coastal areas because it funneled in to this unusual topography through this cove, it mm. was three times higher land. Mm. So the entire town was wiped out in about 10 seconds. Oh, geez. And uh, there are still not rescue people. There's still not rescue groups in there. Oh. And so when I heard that this had happened, and when I had actually pronounced it on my blog saying it's going to happen this month, not only did I feel a little bit guilty, I also felt now it's payback time. These people have given me so much for 37 years. Yeah. And there's a beautiful Japanese expression called ongaishi, which means to pay your to pay back your dues to people. Mm-hmm. Those who supported you and helped you and fed you and given you money and support. Mm, and absolutely. so I immediately decided I need to create uh, publicity also, not just going in as a volunteer. It has to be publicity involved so that the outside world can see, hopefully from my reports from within the mm-hmm. disaster zone. And I'm going to get in there whether I have permission or not. I'm just going to guerrilla my way in there because yeah. I have... Language abilities, I can help rescue squads communicate with local people because they don't speak Japanese. Yeah. And interestingly, I'm now living in Nelson, British Columbia, which does have a relationship with that particular town, and I only found out about this three days ago. Wow. <laughs> and the mayor and the whole city are now behind me. I'm actually going on a semi-official uh, visit now. I'm going to hand the mayor of that town a book, which I call the Book of Hope, which is started off as a huge empty uh, notebook in which the Japanese people of this town have already written their messages of support. Arise, Japan. You're going to get out of this. It's going to turn around. I'm going to do a lecture series for the first 10 days I'm there to fund my mission up into the uh, epicenter area. And I'm going to get hundreds of people to write really powerful messages of support in Japanese in this book of hope, and I'm going to take it and give it to the mayor of this devastated town. Uh, and I'm going to use the media there and the media here to accent the spirit of the people. Uh, I want to maybe even do a documentary just called Spirit and uh, show how people who've gone through the worst imaginable triple set of catastrophes, an uh, earthquake, a tsunami, and a radiation scare the bejesus out of you scenario, uh, which, yeah. by the way, I'm not concerned about because I've done my research uh, I've looked at a Cambridge uh, University professor of crisis management and other 
chemical uh, specialists who have said, even if this thing melts down totally, mm -hmm. uh, 30 to 40 kilometers outside of the zone, the amount of radiation you're going to be getting is minimal. And I believe that. I've done my research. All of this massive scare stuff that's been going in the media, you know, is, is way, way overblown. Mm -hmm. Because I've been tracking every single day and talking to people in the area who live nearby. And, you know, one guy uh, who interviewed me on Blog Talk the other day, Thomas Malone in Japan, was with an expert. And when he told this expert that the news is that there's 75,000 times more radiation in Hiroshima, the guy laughed like a horse in his coffee <laughs> and, and said, you've got to be kidding, uh, right? Yeah. So I'm not worried about radiation. In fact, I'm... I'm um, I'm trying to lighten the situation up by saying I'm going in for a bit of radiation therapy to grow my old teeth back, right? <laughs> and uh, so I'm going in. I'm, I'm not as prepared as I should be internally because when you're standing in a place that was a beautiful, picturesque village oh, two yeah. months ago, yeah. a thriving community, and now there is nothing, I cannot imagine what that's going to do to me. Yeah. But... I really want to, to pay back, and I also want to create awareness of how these people can deal with it and, therefore, how we can deal with it because they're the role models par excellence. Oh, I want to get them on the and get the comments. That's what I'm going to do. Absolutely. Oh, that's we wonderful. Well, we're just about out of time, so um, before you go, would you uh, mention to the listeners where they can find your uh, Indeed. Website. Thank you for mentioning that, Lance. You're telepathic. I was going to say that. <laughs> Japanthropologist.com. Okay. Japanthropologist. Um, that's uh, anthropologist and Japan stuck together. Japanthropologist.com has a page where you can track my progress through a GPS satellite link. Wonderful. Find out where I am, what I'm doing, how the people are reacting. There'll be photographs, there'll be YouTube, there'll be reports straight from the front line. Wonderful. And uh, hopefully if we can get more awareness out about this, we can form some really powerful bonds with these people, not only to help them, they are going to help us too because they've been through what a lot of us are inevitably going to have to go through. Well, that's beautiful, John. And, we're, you know, we're all in this together. And the human spirit is an amazingly resilient one. So uh, I wish you the best of luck going there. Send uh, all of those people over there, our brothers and sisters, our love, and let them know we care and we are thinking about them. And uh, we will follow your progress on japanthropologist.com. And we'll Thank you kindly, Lance. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. Maybe we can even hook up while I'm in there if I've got an uplink to the Internet. Yeah. Uh, we can have another discussion. Uh, but thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to talking to you again. Oh, thank you, John. It's, it's been a pleasure. Good luck over there. And, uh, okay. Sayonara. Good night. Sayonara.